Welcome to my channel on the best of fantasy. Do you ever get to the end of a wonderful book and feel as if you're emerging from a dream or a nightmare? Fantasy is a genre that is highly conducive to the weird and the atmospheric. And a lot of us are attracted to the genre because of the authors who can create a sense of the surreal, jarring us from our reality into seeing new things. That is one of the great strengths of the genre, in fact. And so as part of my series of videos on the best of fantasy, top 10 videos where I'm trying to take apart what it is about fantasy that we love, where I'm doing a video on, let's say, authors who make you think, authors who make you cry, who make you laugh, and so on and so on. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing on the authors who create their surreal. And I will be not including certain authors who probably belong on the list simply because I have not read them yet, such as China Mieville or perhaps Mervyn Peake. I just haven't read them yet. I'm getting to them. I have the books, um, especially after my uh, video on authors with great prose. A lot of people suggested I should be reading Mervyn Peake, so I got Gormenghast. I will be reading it. Uh, there also will be no Salman Rushdie or Gabriel Garcia Marquez or, or authors like that, magic realism authors, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm focusing on authors that identify as fantasy authors primarily. Uh, so no Kafka or anything like that. Although, you know, I, I am perfectly fine with someone who would want to put Kafka or Rushdie or Marquez or something like that on a list like this. No problem whatsoever. But I am focusing on the authors who are marketed as fantasy, who, I, who proudly wear the fantasy label. Uh, <laughs> and so that's what I'm going to do. This, this is the, uh, the focus of this channel. So without further ado, let us begin this list. And as always, as always, I would love to hear from you about your favorites, which are, this is a conversation starter. That's all this is. I want to hear about your picks, which are the authors that you think of when you think of the weird in the fantastic, which are the authors that are the most surreal for you. So please leave your comments, but here come my top 10. I'm going to begin with Josiah Bancroft, author of the Books of Babel. One of the things about Josiah Bancroft's writing that for me makes it feel so surreal is the fact that I never quite know how to categorize the Books of Babel. From one book to the next, it always feels like something different, yet interconnected. Even from the very first book, I was scratching my head thinking, what is this? And I think there is something about writers who refuse to be categorized that, make, that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. We like to have our labels. We like to put our labels on things and put them away neatly in our boxes. And when they don't fit, it makes us uncomfortable. And th this, by the way, is gonna be a thread through this video because a lot of the authors that make my top 10 anyway are authors who just defy genre boundaries. They don't care. Uh, they do what they wanna do. And maybe they even revel in defying those boundaries. And, but for me, Bancroft's Books of Babel, I mean, I, there were times when I felt like I was reading something that was almost allegorical, that was functioning on a symbolic level, and yet there was a, a story that I felt like I'm supposed to be believing is actually happening uh, on a more literal level at the same time. And that simultaneous narrative had me always feeling just a little bit uncomfortable. Plus, there are so many things that happen in this series, particularly in the final book, in The Fall of Babel, that are really unpredictable, where Bancroft allows his imagination to soar, and you just try to keep up. That's what you gotta do. <laughs> uh, so I really enjoyed the books of Babel because it made me uncomfortable at times, and it also challenged my imagination. And those are the kinds of writers that I like to see on a list like this. And uh, speaking of challenging the imagination, and uh, I mentioned waking up like you're you, you feeling like you just had a, a, an incredible dream. Well, Dreams of the Dying by Nicholas Lietzau is a book that is all about dreaming, as implied in the title. This is an experience, this book right here, highly atmospheric. Also, by the way, an amazing book that treats depression head on as a theme and does it really brilliantly through the main character primarily. But there's a lot of dream stuff that goes on in Dreams of the Dying, uh, and a lot of it is very nightmarish, I will say that. 
but it is a journey that you go on with this main character. And going through the journey really is a, a way, maybe that's what dreams are too, a, a way of working out the issues that we face in the real world. Well, that's certainly what Nicholas Litzau does in Dreams of the Dying, using dreams as a way of working out the things that we face in the real world, but in a very surreal setting, uh, just very atmospheric, some really good stuff in Dreams of the Dying. My next uh, author will be no surprise that uh, he appears on this list, although perhaps people will be surprised that uh, he is as low uh, or high, I guess, uh, at uh, number eight, as I'm putting him. But it is Steven Erickson, author of, of course, The Malazan Book of the Fallen. I'm holding up a, the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch a novella uh, collection, uh, volume one, because I do feel that uh, often Erickson is at his weirdest when he's, using, he's writing Bocalane and Corbel Brooch, although you can find plenty of weird in the Malazan Book of the Fallen as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Erickson is a writer who is not afraid to go for it, and that includes pushing the boundaries, uh, going to uncomfortable places uh, for the characters, exploring uh, the, the weirder side of the human imagination, and just... In unexpected ways. Uh, there are so many things about the Malazan world that are just absolutely nuts. And I love that. Uh, I love how outsized and crazy it gets and how suddenly uh, you have a, a dragon thrown into the mix or, <laughs> or some undead army or who knows what. And there are a lot of scenes in the Malazan world that Erickson writes that just bring you into an entirely different state of mind through the journeys that the characters are taking through various realms and warrens and whatnot. And coming in at number seven is Ian C. Esselmont, the other Malazan author. Now this might surprise some people, but this is one realm where I would actually rank Esselmont just ahead of his comrade Stephen Erickson. Uh, and I do believe that one of the great strengths of Esselmont's writing is the atmosphere. This guy can write incredible atmosphere. I'm holding up Blood and Bone, one of the novels of the Malazan Empire, and this one particularly just absolutely creeped me out for so much of the story. And as that is what Esselmont does. He brings in the horror element. And of course, Erickson does the same, but I think that Esselmont does it a little more consistently and probably revels in it even a little bit more, bringing in that horror element, getting you weirded out, not only with the setting, but with some of the, the crazy characters that he and Erickson created together. And I love Esselmont's take on a few of the characters that uh, both of them write about in the Malazan world. But Esselmont, yes, is a master of atmosphere and the horrific and uses those elements to the absolute best in his storytelling. And next on my list, speaking of horrific elements, is our Scott Baker, creator of the world of Aarwa in the Second Apocalypse series. Now, I have only read so far the Prince of Nothing trilogy. Soon I will be reading the rest of the Second Apocalypse series, which is the Aspect Emperor series, the four books that follow the Prince of Nothing trilogy. But, oh my goodness, Prince of Nothing was enough to give me the heebie-jeebies. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, uh, the baddies in here. I mean, I'm not going to do spoilers, but whoa. I've never seen anything quite um, as grotesque as what Baker does in the Prince of Nothing trilogy. And he really does not shy away from portraying the most putrid and uh, disgusting aspects of humanity. <laughs> and it's just very unpleasant and somehow brilliant and at times beautiful, his writing. Uh, it's really quite something to read. Uh, but his world is extremely bleak, I will say that. And there is some really difficult stuff in The Prince of Nothing and I assume probably in the other books as well. Um, but in terms of uh, you know, sexual assault and that kind of thing. So that does come with a, a bit of a warning. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly, he's an incredibly gifted writer um, who he succeeds in making me very uncomfortable, but in ways that challenge me intellectually too. Because it's not just about the horrificness of some of the creatures in this world. It's also about how he makes me think about, gosh, do I have a shred of free will at all? <laughs> and getting into that through some very skillful storytelling. So R. Scott Baker definitely, for me, belongs on a list of this sort. So now we're getting into the top 
five, the top five of the authors who create the surreal for me anyway. And so these, these are all authors, again, who completely disregard genre boundaries. They have a great time just reveling and going wherever they wish, whether it be fantasy or science fiction or horror or uh, apocalyptic, you know, futuristic, whatever it is. Um, but the author who perhaps you th might think of first when you think of that sort of thing is probably Stephen King for many of us, author of the Dark Tower series. There's just so much of that in this series that there's Western in it too, by the way, and all kinds of coming of age, just you name it. It's in this series. It's, it's just incredible what Stephen King is able to achieve. And there is some weird stuff going on in the Dark Tower series. I mean, some really weird stuff, but I love it. I'm here for it. I, I had a great time with the, uh, the grotesquerie and the, the, uh, the hijinks and and even comedy infused in the midst of all that. It's just incredible how Stephen King mixes all that from his, his just amazing imagination. And one final important note here uh, from the Dark Tower series is how later in the series, in the last few books, there's a, a meta element that really starts to mess with your head as well. And I know a lot of people, some people don't love that. I loved that part of it, the, the meta element. If you've read the series, you know what I mean. For me, that enhanced the weirdness of the whole experience, and I loved it. Uh, so Stephen King, definitely, and for many people, probably would be even higher on the list. But my number four is going to be Susanna Clarke, author of Piranesi, but also of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And yes, there is strangeness uh, <laughs> in, and uh, talk about atmospheric. I mean, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell is one of the most atmospheric books you can read. But I think it's Piranesi that probably made me put Susanna Clarke as high as I have on this list. This is a book where you feel like you're waking up from a dream, where it, and it, the effects linger for days and even weeks. And even now, thinking about the book, I feel that, again, that sense of the surreal. The world of Piranesi, if we want to call it that, is simultaneously very stark um, but also somehow incredibly rich. Uh, the, it is a, an, it's one of the strangest journeys I've ever been on, this book. And the less I say about it, the better. Uh, famously, it's a, it's a book that's difficult to describe. That's how weird it is and how it just doesn't fit um, under the normal kinds of descriptions. But yeah, people try to avoid talking about the book because it just gives away so much when you do about it. And it's something you want people to discover for themselves. And it's, it can take a little bit of time as well, even though it's a short little book. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to feel like, okay, here is where I'm, because you feel uncomfortable at first. You're like, what is this? And th that's what these authors do to us. And the funny thing is, as much as at first it feels like it's hard to get into the story, by the time you're at the end of it, you feel like you can't even emerge. Like, how do I wake up from this now? And that's not an entirely bad thing in the case of Piranesi. Uh, it's like a dream that you can't quite snap out of, but you want to linger in that dream because there's a certain beauty to it. Even as it is melancholic and even sorrowful at times, there is definite beauty to Piranesi and to Susanna Clarke's gorgeous writing, by the way. So who could be my top three? Well, I am absolutely delighted to tell you that for me, Mark Lawrence is my number three, and this is because of this book, not only this book, the book that wouldn't burn. I have my beautiful new hardcover copy of this in anticipation of getting book two in the series, the book that broke the world, I cannot wait, that is coming out in April of this year, 2024. Uh, so I'm very excited. But even before this library trilogy, I would have probably put Mark Lawrence on this list, but maybe not quite as high on the list because you have these surreal elements in all of the trilogies of his that I've read so far. Uh, I think of the Prince of Fools, uh, the first book in the Red Queen's War trilogy. And actually, it gets even, as you go through the trilogy, Liar's Key and, and um, all of that, it, it gets even more surreal, actually, now that I think of it. Uh, it it's crazy. There are scenes in realms that I don't want to say exactly what they are, but there are scenes in realms that... Uh, you're like, whoa, this is a trip, okay? <laughs> that happens. And also, Lawrence is a writer who's like, uh, 
science fiction, fantasy, whatever you like, you know, uh, that's, he, he's going to write it when he feels like it. And I just love that. Um, he disregards those boundaries and you think you're reading a fantasy and suddenly you wait, oh, this is actually science fiction or whatever, you know, you just keep going in the story because it's such a great, compelling story. And yeah, he makes you a little uncomfortable at times uh, with that and with the, where, with the places that he takes his characters, not just externally, but I would say also internally, because with the Broken Empire trilogy, with the Red Queen's War trilogy, uh, you are in those characters' heads. And sometimes that's not an altogether orderly place to be or pleasant, uh, but it is a place that is very much worth exploring. But it's the library trilogy, my goodness, where Mark Lawrence just absolutely turns on the weird and in the best possible way. Just, I mean, if you know anything about the library, it's called the library trilogy because of the setting, which is, uh, without spoiling anything, let's just say it's an infinite library. And just imagine what you can do with that. Uh, that is just, wow. Talk about uh, a, a surreal experience. Uh, it is amazing what Mark Lawrence does in the book that wouldn't burn. It's an experience that I kept thinking I, I knew what I was reading and then I'd get to a certain part and I'd realize, oh, everything I thought before is actually a little bit inaccurate. Okay, now I know what I'm doing. And then I get to another point where, oh, well then in that case, maybe now I know what I'm doing until I got to the end of the thing and realized oh, I need to reread this. I want to reread this. It's the first book I can remember feeling. Get to that last page and, and the, the, the primary feeling is, I want to read this again right now <laughs> because of what he does in this book. It's just tremendous. I love this. I can't wait to see what he does in the book that broke the world. And now we're down to the last two here. And I'm sure a lot of the fans of this particular author would insist that uh, he be number one. Uh, but and he, I considered it. I really did. Uh, but wait till you see who my number one is. But uh, definitely up there in terms of making me uncomfortable and putting me in a state of the surreal is Gene Wolfe, author of the book of the new sun. This stuff is uncategorizable. Uh, Gene Wolfe is a brilliant, brilliant author. Certainly an author who makes me think, but an author who, yeah, I just did not know what to think at times too. <laughs> it was just incredible. Uh, I'm still not sure what I read uh, in Book of the New Sun. Uh, a lot of people will say that uh, the first time you read it is really just to, to get you ready for the second read, which is when you understand it a little bit more. I'm sure people would say you can keep reading it again and again and still pull stuff from it and realize things that you didn't before. But I, I really felt very challenged as I was reading the Book of the New Sun in the best possible way, it just intellectually challenged. And there's just, I mean... I probably only really need to say one thing, which is Al Zabo. And you want to talk about weird. I mean, that is, I mean, there are so many weird, just bizarre, out of nowhere, seeing characters showing up uh, just out of nowhere. Like, boom, there they are. And it's like, how did you get here? You know, <laughs> I mean, what a coincidence. This stuff happens again and again and again because I think Gene Wolfe is writing primarily about ideas in here. He's writing about theme. He's, he's, this is a very theme driven book. And sometimes the plot is just secondary to that. And it does some really weird things in the process. Um, but yeah, Gene Wolfe uh, is a writer who put me in the weirdest place in my head. And the effect of this, uh, this read, Book of the New Sun, still is with me. Weeks and months later, uh, I still think about this book and think, wow, what is that? Uh, but I love that. And that means I'll probably... Re, be rereading this thing. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain to be rereading uh, Book of the New Sun and more of Gene Wolfe. And finally, my number one author for the weird stuff, for the, the dreamlike and sometimes nightmarish qualities that he brings to his writing is Neil Gaiman, author of The Sandman, American Gods, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, and so many other books that give kids everywhere and adults, all kinds of weird dreams. I mean, <laughs> I'm actually in the midst of the Sandman right now, and it is very atmospheric. It is crazy. And it is about dream. This is about dream. This is, uh, and that, that is something I realize is very common to Neil Gaiman's writing. And not only does he write about dream, but he makes me feel like I'm in one, even after I put the book down. 
Uh, so yeah, this is he's. I I think Neil Gaiman is the king of the surreal, uh, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to fantasy, uh, and in all of these books, he's constantly challenging me. He deals with the grotesque, with the difficult. Uh, he is capable of pivoting so fast from the beautiful to the disgusting. And I'm just kind of bewildered uh, because he, he can do that. I mean, he's a very gifted author and exploring the full array of human experience and, and in a way that is very provocative and will keep you thinking for a very long time, which is why Neil Gaiman is my number one author who creates the surreal. So there's my list. Now, I would love once again to hear your thoughts on these authors and any others that you think belong on a list like this. Uh, I'm always looking for great recommendations, so please do leave your comments. And that is it for me for now. Until next time.